to you that you do not want to be the student that has to pray to God before and after every exam that they pass. This video is made for the sole purpose to educate. The producers and hosts do not assume any responsibility for misuse or misunderstanding of any of the information shared. Peace for now. Right into this video and I hope that you watch until this end. I am doing this new thing where I would like to give back for the money that I'm getting from YouTube. I don't think it's fair for me to keep it. I have to give it back to the viewers, give it back to the YouTube team that's working with me now. And I think that it would be best to start giving giveaways. So be sure that you stay tuned until the end of this video because there will be a giveaway code and it's by random selection that somebody gets chosen. This video is going to be about the 10 most common mistakes that most med students make. Mistakes that might keep you from passing, mistakes that might keep you from improving your score, if you've hit a plateau from getting over that plateau, or mistakes that are simply keeping you from moving forward. Common mistake number one, taking too many notes. Yes, notes are important because if you realize it or not, but writing is your most Writing is the strongest point of focus. When you are writing, you are completely focused on what you are writing. And you cannot pass medical school without taking some notes that you need to review later on. And maybe these notes are already made for you that you're going to review later on. Okay, let's just think about it. You have an exam coming up. You took all these beautiful notes. You got a binder this thick filled with notes. But do you have time to review them? Of course you don't. This is medical school. It is literally a fire hydrant just coming at your face all day long and it does not stop. Even now clinical rotations, the information is just getting even bigger. And there is a world of a human body that you're trying to master. So taking too many notes will hinder you. And I'm going to talk about how you can avoid it and what you should do about it if you are doing it. Because notes is not the problem. You need notes in your life. It's learning how to take notes. It's learning how to condense your notes. Okay, so my first tool uh, to make sure that I'm taking notes efficiently and effectively is by writing my notes without looking at whatever is in front of me. So whether it be a video or a PowerPoint, do not just regurgitate it. If you're going to just regurgitate it, you might as well just look at that PowerPoint again. You know what I mean? So if you're trying to take some things in a PowerPoint and rephrase them into your own words, the best way to do that is to look at that slide, dissect that slide, then rewrite it in your own words without looking at that slide. That way it is a more condensed version of what you just read. And that leads me to saying, you know, when you make notes, I really more than one line per whatever that that topic is. So if I'm taking notes on something that I just saw, I'm going to try to make it one sentence and one sentence only. That way when I'm reviewing, it's like a flash fact. That goes to say that hard topics are very different. Hard topics, let's say it is a pathway that cannot be one line, right? An entire pathway is a hard topic that you're going to have to look at again and probably look at the entire pathway. But what I would do is stare at the pathway and see what mnemonic I can come up with or what connections I can draw and then those places will now be x'd out so that step will be x'd out because you know what that makes sense it should go from this to this because this is a dehydrogenase so it's taking this out so those steps x out in your own notes that way when you're rewriting the pathway is some type of active memory happening and it's not about xing out the ones that the teacher's going to ask you on. The point is you're looking at this over and over again. It's in your handwriting. So you will understand it better. You will. You just want to make it easier for you to look at the notes. And the best way to do that is if, you know, it's, it's much less to look at. Mistake number two, and I'm guilty of this. I did this a lot during basic sciences and wasted so much time. Multiple passes of the same exact thing, same exact resources. I know some people who have done boards like 20 times. So they take all of boards and copy all of boards into their VLC, their quick time player, whatever they're watching it on. And they rewatch it all over again. But you know, okay, the first two, I know that, you know, I know these first two, these first two videos. I don't need to rewatch that video. I get all of those questions, right? So let me just pull out this part. Um, for example, cardiology, you don't need to copy all of Boris cardiology. He is a cardiologist. So that's a very dense, that's a very dense chapter, but you may just need to review Wigger's diagram, right? And then the PV loop. And then that's it because everything else you understand, the hemodynamics you may not understand. So that gets pulled out and then you do that as another pass. Okay, mistake number three, <laughs> going to lecture. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I'm just joking. Please do not get mad at me, AUA or whatever university that you're from. No, I am just joking. Lecture is very, 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 very important. What is not important and what wastes your time is going to lecture and not preparing or going to lecture and not being present. So if you're going to be at your lecture, be present. Be have your mind ready to absorb this information as much as the information as you can and the only way to do that is if you do pre-reading to prepare for that lecture but you cannot go to lecture expecting it to teach you everything because chances are you're going to zone out at one point and then from there on the teacher has lost your attention forever or at least until a break right we have to stop that you have to go to lecture prepared knowing i read this and this one word I don't even understand this word. So when he says this, I'm going to pick up on this to make sure that I understand this word or raise my hand and ask questions about this word. Um, passive learning for me is only done on the first pass, that's it. Everything after that is very active where my brain is doing things, my hands are doing things, I'm picturing the movements, I'm picturing what they're talking about. So at my school, some lectures were mandatory, some lectures were not mandatory, but if I had to go to a lecture or if I wanted to go to a lecture, I was there fully present and I made sure that I was prepared for that lecture. I read through the PowerPoint at least one good time and made some light, light, very light notes because the first pass of anything should be very light. The first time you see something, you should actually have your pencil and highlighter down. Do not take any notes because you don't know anything yet. And that's why you're studying. So you cannot expect to highlight right off bat because everything's going to be new. Everything's going to be foreign. I don't start highlighting until my second pass of the material. And the second pass is typically not the same way that I did the first pass. So first pass was reading the PowerPoint, then I go to lecture. My second pass is not going to be lecture or the PowerPoint. Again, it's going to now be questions, something a little more active, or maybe another resource if I didn't find the lecture or PowerPoint helpful, maybe another resource, but usually, when you do try to limit how many things you do passively. And by passively, I mean a video and you're doing this. That's very passive. You're not doing anything. Even if you think that you're going to try to process the information, if it's all new information, eventually you're going to have to stop and then make it active so you can digest what he just said. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Okay, now the fourth most common mistake that I have seen in my mentees and my colleagues is not having an MQ, MCQ strategy or having a wrong MCQ strategy. Okay, so my biggest tip with MCQs will probably come in a completely different video because having a proper MCQ strategy is very dense. It's something that I cover with my mentees if uh, they request it. So if you want to meet one-on-one -on -one and talk about that, then by all means, let's do it or <laughs> kind of wait for that video to come out. But what I can tell you now about MCQs is that the very worst MCQ strategy, I think, is when you read it and then have to read it again. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, you, you literally just wasted seconds. That's all it was if you have to go back and read it again. So you want to read it the first time knowing what you're looking for. And the best way to do that is to see the chief complaint. So patient complains of, patient comes in of, patient with four days of. Whatever that is, that's your chief complaint. That's the reason why the patient is here. That is the reason why you're seeing this patient. And then from there, you go to the differential diagnosis and you kind of see the answer choices. You see what... So I was a medical scribe and my brain is kind of just wired to think this way. You see chief complaint, then you start thinking differential diagnoses without labs, without the story when the rash was, where, when the rash started, when the cough started. None of that matters what is happening. And then look at the differentials. That way you know what you're trying to rule in and rule out while you're reading the passage. I hope that makes sense. But as you're reading the passage, you know, if the temperature is normal, then you know that chances are it's not a folliculitis. Okay, so mistake number five is viewing medical school as a chore or like being very upset about it and angry about it. You cannot view medical school as a chore because you're going to be in it forever. Like it's such a long time. And even after you finish and you're board certified, you're still in school. You still have to recertify all the time. So this can't be a chore. You have to kind of fall in love with it and become one with medicine, become one with your own body. That will help you understand other people's bodies way more. And if you have to enjoy it, the best way to enjoy it, you're probably wondering, well, how? You know, because I hate this crap right now. I, I absolutely hate it. I want to get out, let me out. But I have crippling debt, so I can't get out. And then my parents, you know, they're going to just disown me. And blah, blah, blah. I mean, come on, you're studying the human body. 
Medicine is interesting. The human body is amazing. If you just think you should feel honored and proud that you are here given a chance to do so. You are here given a chance to take care of your mom, to care, take care of your mother, your father, your aunt, your nieces, your everybody around you is going to be counting on you to take care of them. So you want to fall in love with this as if you would fall in love with taking care of your sibling. If your sibling was sick, you would Google absolutely everything about their disease, the treatment options, you would know every single thing. So treat everything that you study like that, as if it is gonna save your loved one's life one day. Because it can. Realize that you got accepted. Do you know how many people get accepted to medical school? Not many. I know a lot of my friends who got denied, trust me. So you have to realize that you got in. Somebody believed in you. Somebody is breathing that air within you so that you can go and breathe air into others so that you can go and heal and protect and honor and serve and, and live by that oath that we take. So you got accepted. That is something to always celebrate. Every time I was ever down in my school or like, oh my God, I can't believe they're doing this. The first thing I would say is, well, you know what? At least they're giving me an opportunity to become all that I can be. Now, number two, remember when you wanted to brag that you got accepted? Remember that social media post about, oh, I'm going to medical school? Or how you went across seas to celebrate before you left? Remember those moments. Look at those pictures. Bring those pictures with you if you have to. So it kind of like, you know, shake off the day. Shake off all the problems and close your eyelids. And I know this is going to sound strange, but within the darkness, there's still light within your eyelids, right? Especially if there's lights in your room. Easiest thing to do is to focus on that light and to say something very positive and reassuring that's easy to believe, such as, I study and I pass. I study and I will pass. I study and I expect to pass. And, and the thing is, you say this over and over and over again until you feel a little calm. And then you start saying something else or you start focusing on something else or you can hum, making vibrations, tapping your feet. Whatever you can do, put your fingers together and focus on the blood flow, the energy going from one finger to the next. Just whatever you can do to focus on something other than medicine, other than your sorrows, that makes you feel grounded. Okay, um... Tip number six, just move on to the next exam, move on to the next semester, blah, 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 blah. Shake off whatever just happened, shake it off. Um, I was the type of person where everybody else is agonizing. Oh my God, I can't believe they didn't drop the grades yet. What are they doing? Are they doing? I didn't care. I took the test and I just knew I was gonna pass. I just expected to move on to the next semester. I never, ever, 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 ever check my grades. I mean, I may check them at the end of the semester or a few weeks after it's dropped, but I just move on to the next subject area, to the next semester, to the next material as if I had already passed. Because in my mind, I don't even let the option of failure enter. I never even stop to think about what if I didn't pass. It, I, I, I've never said it. You can ask any of my colleagues, my friends, my family members. I may say, okay, that exam was hard. I don't know how I did. I don't know if I performed in the 90s, the 80s, the 70s, et cetera, et cetera. But at the very least, I knew that I passed the exam. I, and I want to say that the main takeaway for this is to make sure that you're constantly paying attention to your thoughts. Um, thoughts create things, you know, they create emotions within you. And you don't want to have any negative feelings driving you because that negative feeling is eventually going to catch up to you and give you negative results. Um, agony and worry and fear and doubt. <sighs> I mean, I just took my breath away saying those words. If you, if you feel the negativity in those words, it just drains you. It makes you feel defeated before you've even found out if you've won. And you can't carry that along with you throughout medical school because I'm telling you right now, it is very easy to fail. I have had so many people around me that failed. So many people that have started before me that are still now in basic sciences, you want to trust in your abilities, you want to trust in yourself and believe that it's only a failure if you didn't learn from it. So you gotta keep going, you gotta keep going and do not give up, do not give up. So mistake number seven is having poor time management. I get it, we have so many to do, so many things to do. And brooming and vacuuming and dusting and then car washing and putting gas in your car, doing your hair, doing your makeup. I mean, the list goes on of what you have to do on a daily basis. But this is now a brand new century. So 
utilize what's around you. I cannot tell you the last time I actually went to a store and everything is delivered. Very small price, a very, very, very small tip. You can have the luxury of having your items delivered. And it's really not as expensive as you think. You can find services that come with the meals already prepared for you or they grocery shop for you and then you just cook the meals. Whether or not, what got me into this way of thinking was when I lived on the island and how wonderful my life was. I'm telling you guys, when I was in Antigua, I didn't lift a finger other than for my books and studying. I had the best maid and cleaning lady. She came, she did my laundry. I also had somebody, I had a chef that would cook for me every single week. You just go and get the food and it's prepared for you. The campus is amazing. They have a entire canteen, but at the, at, they even had food delivery services on the island. They had something just like Uber Eats that brings you all your food. These are things that you can utilize. And if you budget properly, you, you have enough money for this from your loan money. If you're paying out of pocket, I know that's a little harder, but I'm actually really good at budgets. If that's another video that you want to talk about, let me know, comment down below, send likes to this. Now, I'd love to give some advice on scheduling and I'm actually gonna make that video next. I have to find a very nice balance. So find a very nice balance that allows you to um, be a little flexible, right? Because you're a human being, you make mistakes. Um, give yourself enough catch up time. I would say one half of one day every week should be used to catch up. So number eight, I have a lot of tips for this one. It's to stop comparing yourself to others and just do a you, seriously. And I have a story time, but unless if you see somebody's score report, don't trust their grades. People lie all the time. I mean, people lie all the time and they're gonna make you feel bad for not scoring as high as them and chances are they scored worse than you. Do you know how, okay, let's just get into the story time. There was this gunner. Let's call this gunner Dragon. <laughs> So Dragon was like at the top of the class, like doing amazing, you know, always the first one to answer questions and uh, sitting at the ambassador seats and all of this stuff. And everybody respected Dragon. And then one day, you know, I went to Dragon and I said, Dragon, I'm just kind of stuck at this plateau. I can't get past this 92. You know, how do I enter into the 98 range, into like the perfection range? Help me. With all seriousness, Dragon stopped and looked at me and was like, you got a 92? It's like I scored the same on that exam. It was something in the A range and it was the same exact score as Dragon, this gunner, this well-respected person in the classroom, somebody who you knew their voice, they always spoke, you knew who they were because they made sure that people knew they were intelligent. Now, come to find out, Dragon has been in medical school before. So right there, you already have more knowledge than all of us, right? And second of all, brother, I am scoring the same as you. So what did that teach me? to pay attention to Jennifer and Jennifer only. Nobody else's scores matter, and you can listen to how they prepare, but take it with a grain of salt. The only people's advice, the only people's advice that you should actually take are somebody who has been in your position and passed successfully, or the education department, and the everybody else, all your colleagues that are in the same boat as you, should not be your go-to. They cannot be your go-to. You cannot take the, because they're just figuring it out and sometimes you know they luck out and have a really great exam because that's what they majored in undergrad or maybe they were just passionate about it. But the point is everybody should find what works for them and what works for you should be different than what works for somebody else because you are an individual. You are your own person. So if you need help figuring out what works for you, again, speak to somebody that has been through it successfully. You now have me, Jennifer Pierre Lewis, as your personal mentor. Reach out to me, message me, find me on social media, send me an email, all of these yummy things. I love getting feedback and I love helping. That is why I'm doing this YouTube video for free, <laughs> for free, and giving a giveaway at the end. The goal here is to not fully be present it's a marathon i already said all that so advice number 10 <laughs> to find a study spot and make it a uh, version of a minimalist study spot you don't need all of those books you don't need you just just stop fill your backpack up with the very bare minimal essentials and get your butt to where you need to study and that's it what i did was i had one backpack full of everything that i needed and that came with me to where i'd study and then pack it up at the end and then go back so um, my advice for studying spots, if you have the luxury of studying at home, 
couches. Even when I was at my university with a full library, I studied on the couch. I was always out on the couch because, I mean, the exam, you're sitting up straight proper posture, you know what I mean? And you're focused so you don't feel the aches and the cramps. But when I'm studying, I want to be relaxed, not flat on my back, but at least got some spot right here. I will just sit right here, you know what I mean? And I have like a portable little desk and I just put my desk on here. Now I got like a nice little cushion on my back. It makes for great focus because you can stay focused for longer if you feel comfortable. And as long as you're sitting straight up, you know, like at a right angle, your feet, this are your feet and you're sitting like that, you're fine. The only problem is when all the blood is rushing to your head. So you don't, you can't study laying flat. I don't even suggest doing it. And uh, Ottomans are great. Couches are great and really comfortable chairs are great the gaming chairs are great yeah okay and my to-do list if you are somebody that is stuck in a rut or low scores or having to repeat my to-do list is number one don't face it like why are we so harsh on ourselves you know you gotta face it and you gotta realize that you're a failure why <laughs> that's gonna make me feel so bad about myself you definitely it's so harsh you do not want to face it first you actually want to distract yourself with something positive you want to make yourself feel good immediately you want to stop the tears and stop the worrying and stop the agonizing because all of that is just going to give you negative results you need to put a halt to it and to find something that makes you absolutely happy and to do it for as long as you can and then you come back and face reality right i hate saying that your phone just like just literally take it and toss it you're done your screen time i've said this in no so many videos your screen time honestly as a med student should not exceed it should be between four to six hours anything more than six hours of screen time you know your phone tells you at the end of the week and if you don't have the setting i highly encourage you to get an app that does it for you um to tell you how much you used your phone that week and it breaks it down by apps and everything. I, with everything that I do, exceed six hours for that week. And in medical school, I didn't exceed four because everything that's on your phone, right? Social media and all of that stuff, it's going to be there when you finish. It's not going anywhere. And to be honest, it doesn't help you study. So if it's not helping you study and you're in a rut, it's the first thing that you need to, you just need to put it away. You need to learn how to put it away. The way I look at having discipline with my phone is, uh, let's say you are a surgeon, right? And there is an emergency surgery. You're not gonna pick up your phone for hours, like 13 hours without your phone. So if you can't leave your phone alone for that long to save a life or, or to focus, to study, so that you know the material to save a life, then you have some problems with self-discipline. You have to be able to put the phone down and I don't care notifications or dings you get, turn them off. Stop tempting yourself, you know, just put your phone away and devote time during the day. I do it every evening. That's when I respond to people. And I know a lot of people are like, oh, you know, that all like to wait and have somebody wait all day long. But eventually people just understand that and they just text you closer to the evening. I mean, people are very adaptable to your new schedule. And especially if they love you, they want you to succeed and they understand that you have to study and can't respond right now or can't pick up. A very important thing to find is an accountability partner. And that can be yourself. I had to be my own accountability partner because I would expect people to call me at certain times um, for a very long time. I'd have my parents call me every morning. They were my alarm clock and they would have to wait until they hear me turn on the faucet and brushing my teeth to get off the phone so that I know that I have somebody that's making sure that I wake up. So find an accountability partner, somebody that can just give you a call to make sure that you're up and you're alive and you're awake. You can't do this on your own. Um, maybe you can, but it's just going to be a much, much harder journey if you do this on your own. You need an army besides you. You do. And um, reach out to people, reach out to your loved ones, have an accountability partner, somebody that can, you know, check in on you if they see you on social media, like, hey, why are you online right now? You need to go study. That right there is a good friend. <laughs> okay, I think that that is everything for this video. Okay, and my third to-do list, for third thing for on the to-do list, third thing on the to-do list, which is the most important thing, is to talk to someone. And I don't mean like a friend, right? I mean somebody that has been in your shoes or somebody who has seen other people that have been in your shoes, such as the ED department. The education department is at your disposal and they're literally just there all day to help you succeed. 
That is the job of the education department. So it, it floors me that people don't use them more. They should go, they should be your go-tos and have them put you in contact with somebody who's finished this successfully. And um, if you don't know anybody and you don't have an education department at your disposal, seriously, I am here for you. And if I can't help you, I can find somebody that helps, that can help you. I have um, tons of tutors out that I can put you in contact with. Just reach out. As always, this video was just me to help um, whoever's watching. If you have any questions or comments, or if you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. Questions and comments are welcome down below in the comment section. I'd love to hear feedback. I wish you all the best in this journey. And remember that every single outcome in life, you can learn from it. And it's only a failure if you do not learn from it. So learn from your mistakes. They're never, ever, ever, ever. You should never, ever, ever, ever have any regret. It is just a lesson that has been learned. And one thing that I realized is that you do not have to learn all of those lessons on your own. You have people like me <laughs> that have made mistakes and can teach you from my mistakes and from my mentees' mistakes and so on and so forth. Okay, so I wish you all the best and I hope that you enjoyed this video and subscribe for more videos in the future and yeah, peace for now. As promised, this is the giveaway code for this video.